Welcome everybody from the great Northern Plains region. So excited to have you here. We've got our dear friend Kirsten Waite still with me and we're grateful we could welcome back Travis Peterson and Travis gets the, the opportunity to bring us into second Nephi three through five and a little doctoral mastery second Nephi 227 but uh, Travis what do you want to teach us today and help us understand? Yeah, thanks, Brandon. Um, so we're going to look at a little bit of some principles from teaching in the Savior's way. So we're going to focus on uh, teaching in the Savior's way from part two, principles of Christ-like teaching. And uh, we're going to look in the section of teach the doctrine on a principle. Hmm. So so are you ready for this? Ready, ready. Are you ready? All right. So here we go. So first, first principle is the Savior helped people find personal relevance in his doctrine. So here's here's the paragraph, and then we're going to use this to look over the scripture block for the week. Uh, could you do, read this for me, Kristen? You bet. As you consider the needs of those you teach, think about how the truths in the scriptures could be meaningful and useful in their circumstances. One way you can help learners see the relevance of the truths they are discovering is by asking questions like, how can this help you with something you are experience, experiencing now? Why is it important for you to know this? What difference can this make in your life? Listen to those you teach. Allow them to ask questions. Encourage them to make connections between the Savior's teachings and their own lives. I think this is a powerful skill of gospel teaching. A wise person once said that uh, no one really cares to to talk about things that they're not interested in. And, and I think it's important to identify those things that are interesting or are relevant to a student. And so using what you just read, Kristen and, and Brandon, I want you to be included in this discussion. I just want to just discuss over this uh, scripture block here on the left. Uh, this is These are the lessons from the manual that we've been asked to cover this week. And and some, some seminaries are different. Some only have four lessons a week. Some might have a in-service day or someone might, you know, have a different schedule that what you can't teach all five. And so you have to make a decision on which ones you are going to teach. So can you just talk me through this, Brandon? When you look over the lesson schedule for the week of 2 Nephi 3 through 5, are there any lessons that stand out to you that you feel like are really relevant to your students that you would really like to make sure you cover in class? And that's hard because I have to separate what I want versus what I feel would be best for them. Yeah. And I know in Nephi Psalm, he talks about his pains and what he's gone through and the afflictions and how he relies on the Savior. And so that one just jumps right off the page to me as something that my students would love to be able to feel the relevance of what Nephi is going through and what they're going through. Well said. Well said. Would you agree, Kristen, or, or would you have another lesson that kind of speaks to your class and to the, te the students that you teach? Well, depending on my class. So actually, two of them are jumping out at me. For one of my classes, I really, having a strong testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith and all that we enjoy because of the restoration of the gospel, um, I feel would be really important for one of my classes. And my other class we spend a lot of time talking about how to find and feel joy. And I think that living after the manner of happiness in second Nephi five would be very beneficial for them. Yeah. So my counsel to all of our called teachers is to really look at the week. I, I don't know when they, when you might be looking up the up for the upcoming lessons, but in my mind, usually on, on the Friday or sometime that weekend, I'm looking at the overview and I'm kind of looking at my schedule and I'm kind of deciding, okay, which ones are going to make the schedule and which ones are not. Remember we're a, we're a home centered church supported uh, organization. We, we we want to facilitate what's happening in the home with what we're doing in seminary, but that also means that we don't have to cover everything. And so we have to make sure that we decide on what's going to be most meaningful for our students. I think it's really important, though, to, to make sure we understand that we never skip doctoral mastery. So whatever our schedule is, we, we always make sure we make room for doctoral mastery. We, we want to hit that. But uh, in, in my case, I I know I'm kind of like you, Brandon. I think about a lot of my kids and what they're going through right now. 
And, and I just know that a lot of them are struggling. And, and I think second Nephi four is kind of a must for me. I just feel like a lot of my kids are going through some experiences right now that they could use some connection with the savior and how he can help us get through some really hard times. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today is we're going to do some lesson ideas for second Nephi four, but I just really encourage to go through this process of deciding what's going to be best for your students as you look over your teaching schedule. So are we good with that? Any other comments on, on this principle of choosing what's best for your students? No, I think it would be wise for teachers to take a little snapshot of that quote, because really, as we are deciding the what we're going to teach and how we're going to teach it, this is a great guide for us to get past what we want and make sure that we always have the students at the forefront of our minds. Yeah, it's a big deal. I mean, and and I love how you brought up, Kristen, you know, focusing on the prophets, awesome, and the restoration. But but this lesson, 2 Nephi 3, is a little bit more academic work and, and trying to figure out a little bit of how Joseph Smith is being prophesied of in 2 Nephi 3. And, and I don't think you skip it, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I just know for some of my students, I don't know if they would feel as much as they would like with 2 Nephi 4. And I, I think it's important just to make those decisions based on what you know about your students. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're, we're going to go on to a, a, just another part of teaching in the Savior's way. This is in part three, again, still with principles of Christ-like teaching. But we're going to focus on invite diligent learning. That section there has some great principles of, of how to invite students to, to be a part of your lesson. And uh, the one principle that I want to focus in on today is the Savior helped others take responsibility for their learning. So I've got this little quote uh, from the manual. Uh, Brandon, it's your turn to read. Would you be willing to read this? It might seem easier to just tell learners all the things you think they should know. However, Elder David A. Bednar counseled, our intent ought not to be, what do I tell them? Instead, the questions to ask ourselves are, what can I invite them to do? What inspired questions can I ask that, if they are willing to respond, will begin to invite the Holy Ghost into their lives? I, I love that question. What can I invite them to do, right? I, it's kind of like what you said, Brandon, earlier. It's really not about me. It's about what's best for my students. Well, on the on the sidebar here, these this is, comes right out of teaching in the Savior's way are some ways that you could apply this principle. A lot of them are great ideas. They're, they're very general. They're not very specific, leaving you a lot of room to kind of think about how you might do this with your lesson. The, the one principle or application I'm going to focus on is asking questions that encourage learners to find answers in God's word. I just think that that's really a great skill. Like if you're trying to give them something to do in the scriptures, find, allowing them to find things in the scriptures on their own is a great teaching skill that teaches like the Savior. And so that's that's what I'm going to try to model today with, with 2 Nephi chapter 4. We're going to focus on these verses and we're really going to just try to focus on questions that encourage students to find answers in the Word of God. So I've got three activities I just want to suggest that we could do. And, and a lot of this comes from the teacher's manual. What I've done is I've looked at the teacher's manual and I've adapted it a little bit more to be uh, more focused on helping students find answers for themselves in the scriptures. So that's that's kind of the background to this. So activity number one. Is, is an object lesson. I think, I, how can you teach the gospel without just a little object lesson, right? So, <laughs> Kristen, you're, you're, you're going to be my, my guinea pig. Are you okay with this? Great. It's, it's, it's only because of this idea. The Holy Ghost is really like a mirror of truth. And this comes from Jacob chapter 4, verse 6, that the Spirit speaketh of things as they really are. You know, I know there are some mirrors that distort your image. But most cases we use a mirror because we want to see things as they really are. So here's the object lesson. Why why do you use a mirror to put on makeup, Kristen? <laughs> why, why is that part of uh, doing makeup? Why would you want a mirror for that? So that your mascara doesn't end up in your bangs, right? 
<laughs> and your lipstick doesn't end up on your cheeks. <laughs> so how close, how close do you get to the mirror when you're, you're doing your mascara and your eyeliner and your, uh, how, how close are you getting? Depends on if I'm driving or not. <laughs> you should not admit this. This is recorded. <laughs> how, how close uh, are you so when I'm putting on my makeup, I do like it to be, I'm not going to stand in the other room and then look into the mirror. I need it to be pretty close in front of me so that I can see, um, to make sure that when I'm putting my mascara near my eye, I'm not going to poke my eye out. Right. Yeah. So you want to be close enough that it actually is beneficial. Yeah. Uh, describe to me lighting. Uh, how, how's, how's lighting when you're doing this and why is that important to have good lighting? Well, if you're putting your makeup on in the dark, it's like putting it on without a mirror. Yeah. So you do have to have some good lighting. Yeah. I, this is a fun conversation to have with teenage girls. Just, just saying. It's just a fun conversation. So here's a question for everybody. I'm going to put Brandon on the spot. Would you rather go all day with an obvious problem with your makeup or your wardrobe? Or would you rather have someone correct you and be like, hey, dude, you got, you got a stain or you got your, your flies down or like, would, would you rather have someone correct you or would you rather go all day with that problem, Brandon? Correct me all day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think this is one of those principles that I think is great about the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost will correct you. And sometimes we don't like it. So I want you to look at verses 16 and 19 through 19. Looking for how Nephi feels about his imperfections and flaws, I think that's an important part. But just also just consider for a moment our object lesson. Why is this a good thing? Like, why is this a good thing? But I know that you're familiar with these verses, so let's let's just get right to it. I'm not going to give you a just real quick. Read. Did you mean Second Nephi four? Yes, Second Nephi four. Okay, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Obviously, you could tell that I prepared this slide in the dark. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering you. if you wanted me to wait till the end of the presentation to tell you or yeah. right now. So yeah, I'm hoping my other slides are right. I hope I don't make the wait, same. Was this slide. the object lesson? <laughs> no. I was going to say, not. this seems like it's part of the object lesson here. <laughs> no. Sometimes we need some course correction. Right? This is to let all the teachers know that it's okay to make mistakes. <laughs> okay. Would you look at 16 through 19? Yes. What do you see that Nephi describes as his imperfections and flaws? And why is this a good thing? Why is it good that he sees this? I like how he says in 19, the good part in 19 is that he rejoices, uh, that he desires to rejoice because he knows in whom he has trusted. Yeah. That even though there are these character flaws that he has, that he is a wretched man. Um, because he grieves because of his iniquities, there's somebody greater, and that's the Savior Jesus Christ, whom he trusts to help him overcome that. Yeah, and and I think that's there's what do you think the relationship is between? Yeah, I mean he starts off at verse sixteen and seventeen, right? Of of my soul delighteth and and all these wonderful things, but then in verse seventeen he's like, nevertheless, I'm so overwhelmed with my flaws. And then you, you think about what you pointed out in verse 19 and why that's so important. But what's the relationship there, Kristen? I think it's that um, it reminds me, honestly, of, of how we find hope in President Nelson's quote, right? That the joy we feel has everything to do with the focus of our lives being yeah. on the Savior, Jesus Christ. So the relationship here to me is. He knows where the hope comes from. He's sad and has godly sorrow for the weakness that he um, experiences in life. But is he ever so grateful for a way to overcome that? Yeah. So, Brandon, can you relate to this? Can you relate to Nephi with this struggle? Absolutely. I mean, you were looking at the end of verse 17, but I was looking at verse 18. The temptations and sins that so easily beset me. And I just wrote in my margins, Laman and Lemuel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important that he identified it. But if it would have stopped in verse 18, then that's where the rest of us are a lot of the time, right? Where we just stop at where we're so frustrated and weighed down and, and feeling so imperfect. But 
he's helped us identify not to say this is where I'm at, but this is where I'm going. And because of Jesus Christ, I know I can be better. Yeah. And and that's a good thing, right? I, I know that it hurts to be corrected. And, and I know sometimes we don't want to look in the mirror, right? We'd rather not see. But if we're really going to change, if we're really going to have opportunities to become more like the Savior, we got to have Nephi moments. We just do. We just have to be told that there's some things that that we got to fix. But I, I that's why verse 19 is so important. And Kristen, you said it beautifully. It's just so important that that Nephi just doesn't end on. Can you imagine how this chapter would feel if it ended on verse 18? <laughs> it would just feel really down, but but it doesn't. And one of his biggest cheerleaders on earth just happened to just pass away, right? His dad, yeah. who was in the ship with him, who was always saying, yeah, you know, your brothers can be a bit, but the Lord's got us, has just passed away. So it's, I just, I feel for Nephi and I'm like, he gets, he gets me. Yeah. <laughs> Teaches I, me how to reach the, the Savior even better. I, I just love this. And, and this is a great plot spot. I, so Brandon already pointed out, you could do a lot of application right here. If the spirit's there and the kids are getting it and, and, and you could, you could really just write down, Hey, this is a great chance. What's one thing that you feel like, you know, you're you're working on and why is it okay that you know that? You know, and and let them let them have a chance to write that in their scriptures or or to make a note of that. I mean, this this is relevant. That everybody feels this way. Everybody feels down and I think this is just one of the times just to testify of Christ and say it's okay to feel not good enough. It's okay. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. What's not okay is staying there you know, staying where you're at. That's not, that's not what God wants. The whole point of you seeing what needs to change is so you can change it and fix it. Just like a friend saying, Hey, you know, you, did you know that your makeup is kind of, yeah, you can go fix it. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's, it's a helpful thing. So anyway, that's activity. Number one, I know we probably took too much time on that activity. I'm going to just show two other activities in summary that you can do. Okay. So after doing this with your, with your students, uh, here's here's another activity that I think is really helpful just for the sake of variety, using some pictures. Uh, I think this is a skill that Nephi does. And, and so if you looked at verses 19 through 25, he kind of reviews over some of the things that he knows that the Lord has done for him and, and letting the students see if they can match, you know, and you can make it a competition to see who can match the most, the quickest, whatever way, you know, to add some variety. But here's your here's your question that I think gets them into the scriptures is why do you think it's important to remember what God has done or blessed us with in the past when we face challenges? And, and then letting them search the scriptures. What evidence can you find in verses 26 through 29 that has helped Nephi, right? I mean, it, it it's so important to remember past experiences. It's just so important. I mean, you can handle any trial if you really can remember what God has done for you in the past. And and I think I think it's a great opportunity for them to see that with Nephi and then transition that to like, how is your past experiences helping you now and what you're going through today? And kind of an application there. So that's that's activity number two. And activity number three, I, I just, I love the end of 2 Nephi 4. And this is a, just a skill of having them search for meaning. Uh, I don't think you have to do much with, the, with, with teaching this. I think it's more of, I just need to get out of the way of my students. So I would just say, read what Nephi says in a prayer, looking for what Jesus Christ can do for us and our challenges, and just highlight anything that's meaningful to you. And then, asking some follow-up questions. What did you feel is important for us to know about the Savior? What, what did you learn about him? And then a, a great follow-up question is, how have you come to know that for yourself? Like, how do you, how you know that, that the Savior is a rock that you can depend on? How do you know that he's not going to lead you into places that are going to be bad? Like, how have you learned that? And I, I just think it would be a, a wonderful, wonderful scriptural tool to get them in the scriptures and highlighting things that are meaningful to them. So yeah, th those are my three activities. Activity one, uh, doing that object lesson, getting them into some relevancy, trying to get them to see how past experiences lead into good, good outcomes. And then just this last one of just 
really focusing on the Savior and finding meaning in Christ and our hardships. But I, I think those three activities could be an awesome experience in Second Nephi 4. Any, any concluding thoughts, Brandon or Kristen? It's awesome. You know, as we talk about um, being Christ-centered, learner-focused, and Scripture-based, like you can easily see all three of those coming together with the three activities of being learner focused and helping them, you know, put themselves in the pages of Nephi and when they have felt like the wretched man that he is. And, you know, there's that relevancy and application, but staying in the scriptures and searching, but especially searching for Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to help us um, and our students to become more converted to Jesus Christ. So thank you for that, Travis. Yeah, you bet. I, I would just say this, I, you know, sometimes even as a teacher, you might feel like you're inadequate, right? That you're not doing as good of a job as so-and-so or, you know, and, and I just think you're just like Nephi. It's, it's, it's okay. And I just think the more we just trust the scriptures, trust the students, and definitely trust the Savior, I, I, you're going to have good experiences in the classroom. It might not happen all the time. There's Laman and Lemuel moments. <laughs> there's there's problems, but but I just have a testimony. The more the more we just put trust in the Savior, trust in the students, trust in the Scriptures, it just it happens. It works really well. So I just leave that testimony with you. Oh, wretched teacher that I am! Is that what you're saying that some of us may say every once in a while? <laughs> I. I've had days, uh, yeah, many days that I've felt that way. And and it happens. It just does. It's well, part it's, of what we're here. It's good to then hear. Start master... pleading, deliver me, right? <laughs> deliver me. Yeah. It's good to hear that a masterful teacher like you has said that before. I feel better now. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, what a great scripture block. There's so much good here. And thank you for the principles, not just from 2 Nephi 4, but on how to choose on which principles to teach and being very student-centered and focused on what what's best for them. Kirsten, any final words? No, oh, I think just amen. Thank you, Travis, for these great activity ideas. They very much are Christ-centered, student-focused. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. And teachers, we hope you have a great week teaching this. And uh, take care. We love you.